Well, what a beautiful day we've been blessed with today, amen? Uh, not only beautiful outside, headed towards 50 degrees, not a bad way to get ready for spring, right? But a beautiful day here as we gather together to worship and turn our eyes to the Lord. All right. Um, so if you've had a chance to look through your bulletin and actually see a bulletin looking back at me with the, the note, you already are well aware of what today's message is. Uh, today we're going to be dealing with a certain Bible character that really needs no introduction. He is probably among the most well-known and most beloved of our Old Testament patriarchs. Uh, that, of course, is the story of Joseph. Anybody here familiar with the story of Joseph before I even got up to preach about it? I'm sure some of you could already kind of fill in a lot of the blanks, either from your own readings as you go through a reading plan, or from one of the many movies that have been made about Joseph and his story. Now, I have to admit, our kids actually watched one of those stories today, perhaps the best of all of them. Because admittedly, this was not only my first introduction to the story of Joseph when I saw it, when I was coming into the church at a wee young age of about 20, but it also set the stage for what life in the West would be like for this Michigander. Does anybody know a story of Joseph that happens to take place in the West? Oh, I see a few hands on the back. They know. What's that story? Little Joe, that's right. The Ballad of Little Joe from Veggie Tales. Anybody ever seen it? Okay, many of you have. Perfect. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, they've basically taken the story of Joseph and they've done it with talking and singing vegetables, but instead of being in ancient Egypt, they've done it in the Old West. So there's cowboys and tumbleweeds and little doggies and all those things that really kind of make it just... What? Little doggy. Little doggy. I'm sorry. I'm still adjusting, okay? I haven't even been here a year yet. I think that's like two weeks from now. Uh, or no, it's, it's like a week from now is my, my one-year anniversary here. 24th. I know. Crazy. Um, so one of the things that stands out to me, though, is if you watch Veggie Tales, you know, <coughs> you know that Larry... He is funny. You, of course, are also well familiar, probably needs no introduction to the fact that with Veggie Tales, Larry is a cucumber. Doesn't take a lot of, lot of hard work to figure out that he's a cucumber. Now, I have to confess, I am not a fan of cucumbers. I know I'm weird. This is one of many reasons why I am one of the worst vegetarians in the world. I don't like cucumbers. I don't like broccoli. I don't like cauliflower. I don't like mushrooms. I don't like olives. I don't like tofu. Uh, some of them I can get away with, though. Some of them, if they get snuck into food, like, I find a way to deal with it. There is no hiding from cucumbers. If there is cucumber in a food, you can't miss it. What sorts of words for those of you who have those kinds of taste buds? who enjoy these sorts of things, what sorts of words come to mind when you think of a cucumber? Crisp, smart, <laughs> seedless, delicious. Is it, would you say sweet? Sometimes can be sweet. Now, there are some people who don't like fresh cucumbers. They prefer to do terrible awful, rotten things to cucumbers. They prefer to take what is a harmless, simple, supposedly edible food like cucumbers and do something that I have no idea how it's still edible, and they pickle them. <laughs> now, if you know me, you know that not only do I not like cucumbers, I don't like pickles either. I know it's sad. Like some of these things probably should have come up in my interview, but they didn't. So it's your fault for not asking that question. But what I have to jokingly say is the difference between what was once fresh and, and what were those other words? Juicy and crisp 
And then you get this, which is bitter and just, ugh. It's an opinion, I know. But the, opi- the difference is time and circumstances, right? Well, this, of course, leads us to our story today, the story of Joseph. Because much like how you can take a cucumber, Larry, and under the right or wrong circumstances, and with enough time, you can see how they react. You see how they respond to the bitter circumstances that they find themselves in. You can see what is the next step on how to respond to the difficulties that you go through. Which, like I said, leads us to the story of this guy. Sorry, with the art kit that I was working with, that's Joseph. Most notably, what is he missing? His coat of many colors. Good to be aware of. Good to be aware of. Glad I didn't open it yet. (laughs) Let me tighten that screw just a little bit more. So hopefully, though, you grabbed your bulletin and you did your own coat of many colors. I'd love to see them on your way out the door, by the way. When we talk about Joseph and the story that he went through, the way that I can perhaps best summarize his life is shockingly enough with the word energized. Because the story of Joseph will actually help us to know but it's in the Bible for us to help us to know how we can respond to hard times. When circumstances and time try to turn us bitter, how do we respond? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this beautiful day, for the chance to sing your praises, tell stories of your goodness, and not open your scriptures and hear the story of your love. I pray that you'd speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis 37. Oh, grab your Bibles, open to the story of Joseph, which I will be telling starting with Genesis 37. But while you're doing that, I need to make sure that we are all on the same page, because I recognize that there are people who are with us today, either in person or online, who don't know the story of Joseph very well. Because Joseph's story is not in isolation. I've been preaching a series through the book of Genesis. And in order to get to Joseph, one of the things we have to understand is the guy who came before Joseph. And so to better understand who Joseph is, we need to do a quick refresher on who Jacob is. Jacob, his father, was who we preached about two weeks ago before the kids did that awesome adventurer Sabbath last week. Amen? So it's been two weeks want to make sure that we all remember what we talked about. Joseph is known for many things. His name is, of course, deceiver or ankle grabber. And we see him really showing off his personality right from the beginning. We see him stealing the birthright from his brother uh, in a, a very sophisticated plot that involved lentil soup. We see him a few chapters later stealing or tricking his brother or tricking his father, to steal his blessing from his brother, once again using a sophisticated plot that involved goat's fur and goat skin. And just disguising his voice. But is that really the whole story of Jacob? No. We came to realize that there are multiple ways that we can look at the story of Jacob. Jacob could be the one who is the instigating force of all of the bad things around him, he could also be the one who is the, the, uh, the result of all the bad times that have happened around him. Hmm. Perfect. Because on the one hand, we can argue that Jacob stole and Jacob tricked. But on the other hand, remember that Esau, his brother, was willing to trade away his birthright for a bowl of soup. And lentil soup at that. (laughs) 
I love lentil soup, by the way. Uh, if you've had my wife's lentil soup, you know why I love lentil soup. You know that he stole the birthright blessing from his father, but then you realize just the extent that his father was going to give away perhaps even his portion. We find out that Isaac was ready to give away every blessing he had for his children to Esau alone. We realize that Jacob is caught up in terrible circumstances where his parent or where his dad, his brother, pretty soon his uncle, his, his own children, we find out his life story over and over again. He's going through difficult time after difficult time where it seemed like everybody was against him. Everybody except who? God. That's right. God worked specifically through one person. Who was the one who got involved because God said so? His mother, Rebecca. I wrestled last week with the question, would Rebecca have picked Jacob if God didn't say anything? And so it left me with the question of why did God get involved? And then it realized, if God didn't intervene, would anyone have been on Team Jacob? Most likely, it didn't seem like it. But thankfully, Rebecca was there to let him know, I'm on your, t- your side. And all throughout the story, it's a good reminder that God is on our side too. Even when it seems like everybody who is supposed to be there for us lets us down, God never lets us down. And I said last, or when, when I talked about this story, I just mentioned it again, his uncle, Laban, tricked him. Now we do have to note here, was Laban in on this scheme by himself? The scheme, of course, being Jacob falls in love with one of Laban's daughters. And he says, I want to marry that one. And Laban says, yeah, that's fine. Work for seven years and you can marry that one. And who was that one? Rachel, right. But there were two daughters. And the trickster was tricked. She got it. Because when it was time to get married... When the ceremony happened and when he realized what happened, all of a sudden he realized that his bride was not Rachel, but instead was her sister, Leah. And we find out that Laban had a pair of daughters who were a part of this tricky situation. And as you alluded to, the trickster got tricked. And one of the things I kind of jokingly say is, It must be frustrating to have a family member take advantage of your inability to see clearly to deceive you. Man, that almost sounds a little bit like what Jacob had just done to his father and to Esau. Now all of a sudden, taking advantage of the darkness of the situation. Now he has been taken advantage of, and to be Jacob got Jacobed. It's interesting how things go around and they come around, don't they? Now, one thing I want to mention, by the way, when we talk about Rachel and her sister, which is how it often plays out, right? It's Rachel and her sister. We realize that it's not just Rachel and her sister, that Leah probably should be noted as well. Just because Jacob loved Rachel more didn't mean he also kind of didn't like Leah a little bit too, maybe. Leah, Leah. Potato, potato. (laughs) I'll grab my Hebrew Bible later and I'll try to sound it out. Um, One of the things that I can't help but notice is when we say that Jacob loved Rachel more, it doesn't mean that he didn't love, how do you say it, Addie? Leah. Leah. Because it's kind of hard to have six kids with somebody you don't like a little bit, right? It's kind of hard to have six kids with somebody you don't like a little bit. The other thing that's also just interesting to me is of the two sisters. When they died, one of them got the good burial. And one of them was dumped on the side of the road. I'm not kidding. Genesis 35, verse 19. So Rachel died when it was buried on her way to Ephrathra, that is, to Bethlehem. Interesting. Rachel has pies on the road to Bethlehem. 
So Jacob set up a stone monument over her grave, and you can see that there to this day. Literally, they're traveling along the road. She goes into labor, and they just bury her. Man, I hope nobody goes into labor while traveling to Bethlehem a little bit later on. I hope they make it okay. (laughs) The other one, Jacob himself says, talking about where he wants to be buried, talked about a specific tomb. And in Genesis 49, verse 31, he notes that this tomb is where Abraham and his wife Sarah are buried, where Isaac and his wife Rebekah are buried, and that is where Jacob buried Leah. Okay? So when we talk about favorites, perhaps it isn't as crystal clear as we often pretend that it is. We have this feeling that it was all about Rachel. I think he might have kind of had a little thing for her sister too. Right? We'll actually talk more about her six children or one of them in particular next week. But for now, it's all about Joseph. Because Joseph was the oldest of Rachel's children, all both of them. Genesis chapter 30 and verse 22, we find out that God remembered Rachel's plight and answered her prayers by enabling her to have children. Notice at this point, not only did Rachel not have children, like it seems like she's the only one in the crew who doesn't have children. Leah had had them, Leah's servant had had them, Rachel's servant had had them. Rachel's the only one who hadn't, and God's finally like, oh yeah, I guess you could have kids too. You ever feel like a accident sometimes? <laughs> God finally says, all right, now it's time for this child to enter the story. Genesis 20, or 30 and verse 23 tells us that she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. God has removed my disgrace, she said, and she named him Joseph. For She said, may the Lord add yet another son to my family. So may the Lord add is what this means. I have no idea what's going on with our our screens. My apologies for today. Um, We'll we'll try to keep up with the verses, but trust me, the coolest part of today's sermon is not going to happen on the screens. I'll tell you that right now. So let's talk a little bit about Joseph. Genesis 37, starting in verse 3. This is where you are. You you went to Genesis 37, right? Mm -hmm. All right. I gave you plenty of time. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. (sighs) Do I even need to ask you as we study the book of Genesis, is it a good thing to play favorites with your children? We just can't learn that lesson, can we? No, No, we just do a terrible job with it. But Jacob continues the cycle that the Bible would later refer to as generational sin. What you've seen modeled is what you do, even if you know it's something that you shouldn't be doing. You tend to do it anyway. Really what it takes is someone who can break the cycle. Step up and say, that's not how it's going to be with me and my family. Unfortunately, that wasn't what Jacob did. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children. So one day, Jacob made him a special gift, a beautiful robe, is how this translation puts it. They leave it at beautiful robe because it's honestly a bit disputed in the Hebrew what, this, what type of robe this was. We familiar, we're familiar with the idea that it was a coat of many colors. There are also people who say that the translation is better, a coat with long sleeves. I don't know about you, but I can't help but think that in the desert, the last thing I want would be a winter jacket. So I'll, I'm leaving it generic. I'm going to leave the, the, the picture of Joseph as is and just say, it was a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. So why do his brothers hate him? Because of dad. They hate Joseph because of dad. And they couldn't say a kind word to him. This is where our scripture reading was. So one night, Joseph had a dream. Who gave him the dream? God did. Okay, so we understand here. Joseph's circumstances. Dad prefers Joseph. Why? Because he does. The brothers hate Joseph. Why? 
Because they do. And God gave Joseph a dream. Why? Because that's what God does. Joseph is not the driving force here. All of these circumstances that he finds himself in are not his fault, right? He has a dream. And when he tells his brothers about it, they hated him now more than ever. He said, let me tell you the dream. We're out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before me. His brothers responded, so you think you'll be king over us, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And so they hated him even more because of all of his dreams and the way he talked about them. So there are some things in Joseph's story that are completely not his fault. But there may be some things in Joseph's story that maybe kind of a little bit are somewhat his fault. I'll note, by the way, there is a difference between dreams and visions. I believe God gave him a vision, don't you? This one says dreams. Dreams are funny. Dreams are one side of your brain saying, hey, let me tell you a story. And the other side of your brain saying, whoa, that's amazing. (laughs) Dreams are weird like that, aren't they? These dreams, though, had other people saying, whoa, but not in a good way. And this was not the only dream. After our scripture reading, continuing in verse 9, we know that there's another dream. And so he tells his brothers about it. He says, I've had another dream. The sun, the moon, the 11 stars, they all bow low before me. At this time, he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. And his father, the one who loves him more than all of anybody in the world, scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come to bow to the ground before you? Man, it sounds like didn't take much for Team Joseph to become a, a one-man show, didn't it? Seems like Joseph's the only one talking well about Joseph at this point. And his brothers were jealous of Joseph. And his father wondered what the dreams meant. It didn't take long, just a handful of verses later, and we find out just how angry his brothers were with Joseph because of everything, but particular the dreams. There's a story, they're out with the sheep, They make a decision. They see Joseph coming. They say, come on, let's kill him. We'll throw him in one of these cisterns. We'll tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what's become of his dreams. Like I said, sometimes we face hard times, and it's not our fault at all. But the goal of this story isn't to show us why bad things happen. The goal is to show us how to respond. How did little Joe, who was subjected to all kinds of bitterness and circumstances and time, how did he respond? I'm not going to eat that, by the way. I'm going to do something worse to it. Because the story of little Joe, I'm sorry, Joseph, is how Joseph became energized. Enough time, enough circumstances, and a little dose of God. We find something significant happens to him. I'm just going to go ahead and grab this one right off the top here. Doesn't that look like a pickle. Yeah. <sighs> now something amazing happened in this process. Because what Joseph goes through next is definitely that period of bitterness and disruption or what could have been bitterness and disruption and definitely plenty of time. tossed into a cistern, dug out, sold as a slave, sent away to Egypt. Well in Egypt, lied about, sent to prison. How did he respond? What was the word? Energized. Let me show you what I mean. 
I'm going to ask the uh, AV guys to, to bring down the lights here a little bit. I'm going to close a few of these curtains just so you can see it a little bit better. Um, I also need all of the kids especially to make a pledge here. They will not do this at home. I know, it's terrible. What I have here is a specialty apparatus that I've uh, made myself. I'm not going to tell you that I just took an extension cord and modified it with a couple of nails and a, a pair of wire strippers. What I am going to tell you is if you decide to ignore my warnings and do something like this at home, no matter what you do, play with the wires first before you plug it in. Because yes, what we are going to do is to energize this pickle. You take the nails, you plug them into one side and into the other. Man, that cross is bright. <laughs> is that a good thing? Love how Jesus shines in here. You want to know what else shines in here? I may have killed everything there. We'll see what happens. Nope, it's doing the thing. Okay. It'll take just a second here for you to see what happens. You see what happens when you get energized. I'll admit there's definitely, a, a, it's a chemical reaction. You can ask Dr. Machaki more about this. But it has to do with the sodium, uh, hence the, the color that it's glowing. Uh, yeah, you didn't know that a pickle could glow, did you? You didn't know that what you're putting on your sandwich is actually part light bulb, did you? <laughs> it's not going to blow up, but I am going to go ahead and stop it. It will be okay. I've unplugged it so I can pull this out. I will tell you, if you're interested, it is technically still edible, assuming it was ever edible in the first place. It's medium rare, he said. <laughs> that is one way to cook a pickle. Most people who do cooked pickles will just slice them, bread them, and deep fry them. And, and fried pickles are a thing. Uh, this is the, I don't own a deep fryer way to fry a pickle. But this is what happens when time and circumstances have a chance to get you ready to do something magnificent. And all it takes is to be energized. When Joseph went to Egypt, he did not go alone. The Lord was with Joseph and he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. So Potiphar noticed this and realized that jo the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. It makes me think about Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you are the light of this world, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, although it is smelly enough, sometimes it's tempting to put a lid over it. <laughs> Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand and it can give light to everyone in the house. He says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Sometimes we face hard times, and it's not our fault. The question is, how do we respond to them? Joseph could have responded with bitterness, with hatred and resentment to the people who had let him down, set him up, and tried to kill him. But he didn't. He decided to let his light shine as he pressed forward with a life that glorified God. Now, that being said, of course, sometimes we face hard times, and it's totally our fault, as we acknowledge here. Sometimes Joseph's big mouth got him noticed. Happened back in eat, or in, with his brothers. It happened again in Genesis 39 in a few instances. Who noticed Joseph? Potiphar's wife. Potiphar, but Potiphar's wife. And what ended up happening? He was cast to jail, sent to prison. But what happened there? Once again, he chose to stay faithful. 
The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything, and the Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. One of the things I said a few weeks ago is it seems like God pulled away briefly from the stories of of, uh, Isaac and, and Jacob. God does make himself known from time to time. But God with Joseph, they are, God is all over the place in Joseph's story. Sometimes taking active roles. Sometimes taking covert roles behind the scenes. Simply providing the energy to let us shine. The pickle. (laughs) Unfortunately, though, we know what happened. He went down there, and he continued to shine, and he continued to shine. He, He interpreted a few more dreams. And what did he get out of it? More time in prison. In Genesis 40 and verse 23, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer forgot all about Joseph, never gave him another thought is what it said. I'll note, by the way, the instance of Pharaoh's chief cupbearer being around. Do you know why why he was involved in this story? Chief cupbearer and the other dude, the other dude was the, the baker. They were both thrown in prison because one of them supposedly stole something from Pharaoh, right? I know, I keep tripping on this. I gotta fix this. They supposedly stole something. And do you know what the circumstances were that once they finally figured out who did what? Do you know what the circumstances were that caused this this, uh, end of chapter 40 to, to play out? Pharaoh's birthday was a significant part of this story. Fun fact. We only see, besides Jesus, we only see two other people celebrate birthdays in the Bible. Pharaoh and Herod in the New Testament. And what is the birthday gift given to each of them? Someone is beheaded. And so I would wish Starla a happy birthday. But I'm kind of nervous to see how she chooses to celebrate. (laughs) So once again, He's been abandoned. He's been rejected. And many stories of Joseph play up what happens while he's in jail. If you've watched, for example, the DreamWorks picture of Joseph, you see how it plays up the opportunity to become discouraged, despondent, depressed, and most importantly, the temptation to quit. Isn't that how you'd react? If you choose to be faithful to God, and it seems like God isn't being faithful to you, who is the one trying to convince you that God isn't being faithful to you? Satan. This is the devil's work. The devil, since the beginning of the book of Genesis, has been going out of its way, he's been going out of his way to malign the character of God to get you to turn your back on him under any means necessary. Be it hard times that cause you to turn to anger. Be it hard times that cause you to turn to sadness. To resentment, to depression, whatever it is. His goal has been to tear us down. Now, I don't want to use this story to show us why bad things happen. That's what we learned back in Genesis chapter 3. We know why bad things happen. The question is, how do we respond? And how did Joseph respond? He let his light shine. Anybody else need to be to plug the stinky light bulb back in? I'll do it again later. Don't be upset, Joseph says, reflecting on this story when he reveals himself to his brothers. And yes, we'll talk more about that next week. But he says, don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place because it was God who sent me here ahead of you. He blames God. Or should I say, credits God, gives God the glory. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. He says to his brothers, God sent me here to keep you and your families alive, to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. 
and he's the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of this entire place, and the governor of all of Egypt. Whose fault is this, he says? God's. And that's a good thing. Rather than turning away from God, he continues to point people to God. How do we respond to hard times? Do we pull away from God or do we draw closer? Do we bottle up who we are or do we let God take who we are and energize us so we can shine? The conclusion of the book of Genesis, just a half dozen verses from the end, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20 is perhaps the most famous of all of the verses about giving glory to God. You intended to harm me, he says to his brothers, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Man, that almost sounds a little bit like what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. Now, what we're not saying here is everything's going to be okay. That you'll never face hard times, that you may not get to go through bitter circumstances and tough times. But what I'm saying is when it comes out on the other side, I know who's going to make it okay. And what are you going to do? Are you going to stay bitter? Or are you going to let your light shine? The, story, the goal of this story isn't to show us why bad things happen. The goal is to show us how to respond. I'm going to call my praise team to come up here. I know some of us would just love to, to not have to deal with the difficult times. Spoiler alert, there is a time coming when there will be no more difficult times. There will be no more evil, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death. We're not going to get sold into slavery and, and have our brothers try to kill us anymore. Or, or many other things that could also happen. Thank you. We're not going to have to deal with some of the bitter circumstances ever again. But while we do, how do you respond? Are you turning, are you turning to God or are you running from God? Are you hiding who you are or do you, like Joseph, decide to stay connected to God in a way that is energizing? so that you can let your light shine. I'm sorry that some of you, through the circumstances of life, are no longer cucumbers and have become pickles. <laughs> but it's amazing what God can do with a pickle like me, like you, like all of us. And so no matter what deep waters you go through, our closing song today is Oceans, you'll hear the lyrics. No matter what we go through, we know who's in control. I invite you to stand and sing our closing song today, Oceans. Oceans.